go ahead. Okay, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mike Stamba. I'm the chair of the Kaffner Research Council. And uh, today I'm happy to fill in for uh, Dean Joes, who uh, typically would would host this uh, webinar. But today we have a webinar by Dr. Jeffrey Wood here within the School of Natural Resources within Kaffner. Jeff is an assistant professor of biometeorology. So Jeff's re research focus is on how ecosystems interact with weather and climate. And Jeff is probably uh, quite well known for his leadership at the Ameriflux Tower site just south of uh, campus here. And uh, in addition to his research, Jeff contributes by teaching tree physiology, uh, plant water relations, and micrometeorology within the uh, School of Natural Resources. So today, uh, happy to introduce Jeff and um, provide a platform for this talk, unveiling the fifth National Climate Assessment. So with that, Jeff, take it away. Great. Well, uh, thank you, Mike. Uh, let me share my screen here. And uh, can you just uh, confirm that you can see it? Yep, looks good. Great. Um, yeah, so thank you, Mike, for that introduction. And thank you all for, for joining. I know it's uh, not the best time of the year with the end of term wrap up and, uh, you know, probably visions of rum and eggnog dancing in everyone's head. But um, it is great to be able to be here this afternoon and share with you a little bit about my experience over the last couple of years contributing to the fifth National Climate Assessment uh, that was released uh, a month ago today, actually. And so um, what I want to do today is uh, share a little bit about what national climate assessments are, and then specifically some of the results from the, the Midwest chapter that I was involved with. Um, so to kind of give you a sense of where we're headed, uh, the Midwest chapter uh, we had uh, uh, broken down into five key messages uh, that you see here, kind of focused on agriculture, natural resources, human health, the built environment, and water. And eventually I'll go into a bit more detail. Um, this is kind of presenting them at their highest levels. Um, but before I do that, I'll, I kind of wanna give you more uh, information about how these assessments are developed. <clears throat> so I framed the this seminar around three questions. What are national climate assessments or NCAs? And what is the NCA process? Uh, what did we find in NCA 5 for the Midwest? Um, so if I say NCA 5, I mean specifically the fifth assessment. Uh, if I say NCA, I ref I'm referring to the process in general. Uh, and then I'll end off with a few comments on how one might get involved in a future NCA. Um, so to start off with some background, uh, the mandate and scope of national climate assessments is actually defined by Congress. Um, and so there are legislative origins uh, to national climate assessments. Um, this these were defined in the Global Change Research Act of 1990. And so uh, the, the, the Global Change Research Act charges that every four years, uh, a group called the USGCRP shall prepare and submit to the President and Congress these national climate assessments. And these NCAs should analyze current trends and project trends uh, to look at how um, global change is occurring or, or going to happen um, in the future. And so it's not just a physical science assessment of climate uh, change. Um, there's also an aspect of assessing the impacts on the natural environment, as well as many different sectors uh, of society. And so these are very broad in scope. I just want to get that out very clearly uh, at the very beginning here. Um, and so even at the level of a, of a regional chapter, this is the case uh, as well. So in terms of NCA basics, um, what are we doing and what is the report presenting? Well, we're evaluating um, scientific and technical inputs from a broad range of sources, 
Uh, this involves synthesizing everything from individual studies um, to data and models, and then applying our best expert judgment to characterize the certainty of the assessment, um, as well as thinking about assessing a range of potential impacts. And, and so, for example, uh, thinking about a range of possible future outcomes uh, depending on different scenarios uh, with regards to, say, greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, another really important aspect of how this all works is developing a consensus-based view of the state of the science. And this is done at the chapter level. And so the, the chapter teams have to come to this consensus and everybody has to be in agreement on, on what we produce. Another important point about NCAs is that we have to write them to be policy relevant not policy prescriptive, a subtle difference, but we are just meant to uh, provide an, an assessment on the state of the science and not provide a prescriptive list of, of what should be done. We're producing a document to give to the policy uh, makers and decision makers uh, to help them uh, do their job. Uh, it does have to be compliant, not only with the Global Change Research Act, but also other federal laws and policy and uh, thankfully, the uh, US Global Change Research Program provides uh, the, the chapter team with a lot of support to make sure that we don't uh, run afoul uh, with uh, any of these um, uh, laws and policies. Uh, finally, um, there is an extensive review process and a lot of opportunity for public engagement. So as a chapter team, we aren't working in a vacuum. Um, our material is reviewed many, many times, um, internally and externally, and we engage with the public in different ways. And just to flesh that out a little bit, uh, on this slide, I've kind of broken out how content contributors and review all intersect with public engagement. Uh, so if we look on the left and think about how content um, is, uh, is developed with public engagement, there is an initial call for public input on scientific and technical information. Um, the NCA5 is actually the first one to have an art by climate aspect. And so there was a call for visual art to be featured in NCA5, uh, as well as uh, having the most extensive uh, tribal consultation of any previous uh, NCA. Um, there's also public calls for the author and chapter leads, as well as review editors. Uh, and then finally, in terms of the review process, this involves both public comments, uh, public engagement workshops, um, and agency reviews. And so if you look at this slide, anywhere where you see public comment or public call, that basically means there is something posted in the federal register where anybody is able to go ahead and uh, contribute. Um, so just a little bit more about the nuts and bolts of the development process, uh, specifically for NCA5. Um, th initially, there's a federal steering committee that was established uh, that was responsible for the development of the report. We had nearly 500 authors and 250 technical contributors across the whole of NCA5. Um, the U.S. Global Change Research Program's National Coordination Office was instrumental in making this happen through um, coordination, uh, facilitation, and providing a lot of logistical support to make our lives as chapter uh, teams much easier. Um, and also there is a technical support unit uh, provided through one of NOAA's offices. Um, and they provided key editorial support as well as helping us produce uh, uh, nice figures, help us with data analysis and documentation uh, to, to really make sure that this is done consistently and across all of the chapters. Um, I've mentioned a little bit uh, in general and use the term chapter team, um, but what does that really mean? Here you can see a list of the, the different roles uh, that you uh, have on a chapter team. So every, every chapter team has what's called a federal coordinating lead author, and they're involved from the very beginning and help 
with selecting the chapter lead author. And then once we get going, they play a key role in liaising with the other chapters in the report. Uh, and this is important because, you know, while we're working on our chapter, there are times where we need to know what is going on in, in some of the other chapters. For example, um, you know, the Mississippi River and the Missouri River are not isolated in the Midwest. They flow through other regions. And so we we needed to know what was going on uh, with respect to, to say, uh, water issues in those other regions. Um, the chapter lead author is the person who's responsible for delivering the chapter. So they have a lot more work to do um, and, and making sure that uh, we meet all our deadlines. So um, I was a chapter author um, and the team of chapter authors are really involved with the writing, developing of the figures and, and dealing with comments. Um, technical contributors are identified when there is a very specific input that is needed. And so they are invited to contribute that input, um, but they don't participate in that consensus building process. Um, and then finally, there are review editors who are brought on to make sure that the chapter teams are appropriately responding to public comment, as well as comments from uh, the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine. Um, so to give you a bit of perspective on how much time it takes, here you see the NCA5 timeline. Uh, we're over here on the right um, of the timeline talking about the report. But if we wind the clock back to 2020, that's when the Federal Steering Committee was established. And so you see on the left side of the timeline um, activities like uh, calling for the draft prospectus and building up the author teams. Um, and so it was in around September of 2021 when I came on board and joined the Midwest uh, chapter team. And very shortly thereafter, they told us in about a month, we had to have our annotated chapter outline drafted for review, which was kind of a trial by fire, you know, bringing together a team of people who haven't worked together and, and getting our ducks in a row. Um, and then as we move through time, you see we go through these um, uh, different periods where we're we're writing and developing materials and then they get handed off for review um, at different stages by federal agencies or um, NASM or the public. And that brings us through um, five drafts in total um, to get to the report uh, that was ultimately released uh, back in November. So getting closer to uh, the actual contents of the report, uh, here you see the table of contents for NCA5. Uh, just to give you a flavor of, of the flow of the report, if you look at those um, uh, headings in, in orange text, you can see this, the report begins with uh, material relating to the physical science of climate trends and Earth system processes. And then we move into national topics where all of those chapters are written at, at the level of, of the whole nation. And then it's the regional chapters where we can focus in specifically on issues that are particularly important for you know, smaller parts of the country. Uh, there's also chapters uh, dealing with responses uh, to climate change. Uh, and then finally, there are these focus on um, areas at the end where there are more specific issues that were identified as being particularly timely and worthy of calling out not in a full chapter context, but but really drawing attention um, to these uh, these areas. Um, I do want to point out uh, something that I think um, to to help with managing expectations, so to speak. Um, the chapters are are written in for the most part for public consumption or a very very broad and diverse audience. So the first four sections that you see here in the chapter, um, you know, th th this is written at, at a very high, uh, high level for um, for a broad audience. The more technical aspects of the report can be found in the traceable accounts section, where we discuss the body of evidence that we assessed to to come to our findings. 
And so if you're interested in, in that, I would point you to the traceable accounts. Um, this is another place where you're going to find a lot more information about knowledge gaps um, that we've identified where there's the evidence was was not as strong. Um, so a more scientific and technical description is is in those traceable accounts. All right. So with that all being said, I'm going to move on now and uh, present to you uh, results from our assessment of the Midwest region uh, in NCA5. And my plan is to first present some of the um, climatological and hydrological re results and then get into our key messages. Um, before doing that, though, I do want to acknowledge the whole chapter team, which is outlined here, um, especially Aaron Wilson, the chapter lead, who did an amazing job of keeping us all on track and being an excellent leader. Um, I'd also point out that the review editor on our chapter, Tom Bono, is um, here an adjunct prof uh, faculty member in SNR. Um, and also call out specifically uh, Sam Basile, who was with us every step of the way from the USGCRP to make our lives as authors much, much easier than it would have been. Uh, so first, I'd like to present some results concerning temperature changes. Um, the first point that we wanted to call out related to changes in the last spring freeze date over the Midwest region, and we're seeing trends towards earlier last spring freeze dates across much of the Midwest. Um, so in the figure here, you see our Midwest region as it's defined for NCA uh, outlined in the thick black line. And so these are results that are aggregated to the county level. And so essentially, if you see warm colors, the yellows, the oranges, the dark oranges, that, that is indicative of earlier last spring freeze dates. Um, and spring freeze being defined as um, the, the daily minimum temperature being below 28 degrees Fahrenheit. And so these are trends that are um, calculated over the time period 1950 through 2021. And so you see this consistent pattern of, of trends in towards earlier last spring freeze dates across most of the region. And particularly actually in Southern Missouri, there's some areas in the Ozarks where, uh, where you see a, a particularly strong trend there. Um, we also wanted to draw attention to the fact that it's not just warming over land. Um, we're also observing summer surface water temperatures increasing in the Great Lakes. Uh, these data are shown since the late 70s, um, specifically here, um, I guess 1980 through 2021, uh, data for the four Great Lakes um, where uh, the Midwest uh, borders. Uh, each panel is showing temperature on the y-axis, time on the x-axis. And while the, the, va the values of the temperatures that you may see uh, differ from panel to panel, each one of those has a 25 degree range in temperature. So you can directly compare the, the trend from plot to plot. So the, the trends are shown in red, the observations in black, and you see particularly Lake Superior, Michigan, and Huron showing uh, increases over time uh, much stronger than, than for Lake Erie. So this, of course, has important implications for ecology as well as, as water quality. Um, and so it's not just uh, temperature over land that's increasing, also the lakes. Um, we also um, reported on hydrologic changes in the Midwest. And so I'll sh share a couple of key results here. Uh, the first one being uh, that the frequency of transitions in precipitation extremes is projected to increase by late century. And so what I mean uh, by this is that the frequency of going from extreme wetness to extreme dryness from one month to the next, or vice versa, extreme dryness to extreme wetness from one month to the next is expected 
to increase across much of the Midwest, um, regardless of the of the scenario. So here you see maps showing projections uh, that were obtained using using different uh, what are called shared socioeconomic pathways. Uh, kind of the one on the left being a more sustainable uh, or a sustainability based uh, pathway, middle of the road in the middle, and then fossil fuel development on the right. So you can think of it as basically more e extreme climate change from left to right. Um, so these projections are, are uh, were obtained from a, something called CMIP-6, a coupled model intercomparison project. Basically, this is using many Earth system models and, and using kind of the aggregate results um, to, to obtain uh, the, these projections. And so where you see the warmer colors, the or, uh, you know yellows, oranges, and reds, means that the frequency of these transitions in extremes is is going to increase more strongly. Um, the stippling in the panels shows where it's statistically significant. Um, so in the most sustainable future, you see we we are seeing over a lot of the Midwest still a statistically significant increase in the frequency of these extreme transitions, but middle of the road and fossil fuel developments uh, significant across the whole region and becoming uh, certainly more uh, uh, more uh, a stronger signal as we go into those uh, more extreme scenarios. Um, a, an unrelated point regarding the scientific results here is you'll see there's a citation here uh, that this figure was adapted from a paper. Um, so you know if you're producing science um, that intersects with national climate assessments and you're you know thinking about regions that you want to um, to study, you know, defining them to be compatible with the report makes authors' lives easier and perhaps, you know, uh, more, uh, your, your work becoming, um, you know, incorporated into the reports um, in, in, in the future. Um, so that first result uh, was concerning precipitation patterns. Uh, I now want to highlight some uh, some findings relating to runoff. So one of the sort of fates, if you will, of precipitation once it hits the ground. Um, so what you're seeing here are projected changes in annual runoff. Uh, the runoff was determined by forcing a variable infiltration capacity hydrologic model with CMIP-5 projections. CMIP-5 is another ver the, the previous version of this uh, coupled model intercomparison project. Um, and so you're seeing results here, two maps for two different emission scenarios. Again, an intermediate warming scenario on top, a very high emission scenario on the bottom. And basically, if you look at the colors on the maps, you see a lot of green. Um, the different the shades in the intermediate scenario may not be overly concerning at first if you look at that you see darker greens showing up in that very high emission uh, scenario. And so, but across the board, generally seeing um, more runoff. Um, and though while this doesn't necessarily look so alarming at first, if we break this out by season, the picture is quite different. And we see um, projections for uh, big increases in runoff in, in the winter and springs that are going to increase flooding susceptibility. But then in the summer, the opposite scenario where we're actually seeing projections for less runoff, uh, which increases flash drought potential in the summer. So an important point to, is, you know, it, the, if you aggregate and, and look at different scales of time, uh, that the picture may may change. And so certainly we are seeing very important seasonal differences um, in the hydrologic cycle um, projected for the Midwest. Okay, so at this point, I want to transition now and highlight our key messages for the Midwest chapter. Um, a point of order before I do that, 
Uh, you will see in the next few slides um, reference to confidence statements and likelihood statements. These are two different things. The confidence statements are based on expert judgment uh, after uh, reviewing and synthesizing the evidence. The likelihood statements have specific levels of probability attached that are based on the science. And these are specific to NCA5 or the or NCAs in general. Um, and rarely would expert judgment uh, come into play in determining the likelihood statements. Uh, so with that, um, our first key message concerned agriculture. Um, crop production is projected to, to change in very complex ways. And a lot of this ties back to, to changes in the hydrologic cycle and having more extreme precipitation events and these uh, extreme wet to dry transitions or dry to wet, um, as well as having higher crop water loss in the summertime. Um, in addition, changes in precipitation extremes, um, the timing of snowmelt as well as uh, early spring rainfall are expected to pose challenges to both crop and animal agriculture through things like increased pest or disease transmission, uh, muddier pastures, as well as degradation of water quality. And then climate smart agriculture, however, and, and other adaptation techniques provide potential pathways towards um, environmental and economic sustainability. And th that concept is illustrated in this figure from the report on the right. The idea being illustrated in the middle where you see on top kind of the conventional agricultural picture where the outputs in blue are not in balance with the environmental impacts, if you will. Uh, whereas with climate smart approaches, we're trying to have better balance in the agricultural outputs and environmental impacts. And you can see uh, a range of, of sort of points illustrated around the, uh, the outside there. I'm sure many people here are familiar with with a lot of, of climate smart um, uh, uh, practices and, and work that's going on in Kafner uh, as we speak. Uh, with respect to natural resources, uh, we know ecosystems have been affected by changes in extreme weather and other cr climate related changes. And these are causing negative impacts on a wide range of animal and plant species. Um, a lot of this ties back to increases in flooding and drought that are expected to further alter aquatic ecosystems um, and terrestrial ecosystems are also being reshaped by uh, rising temperatures and decreases in snow and ice cover, um, particularly in the northern parts of the Midwest. And uh, these, uh, these are leading to losses of ecosystem services that are undermining um, human well-being through losses of economic, cultural, and health benefits. Um, there, there are examples of communities adapting culturally and uh, adapting landscape management practices to help with preserving and protecting ecosystems and the services they provide. And as an example of kind of a holistic kind of um, land, uh, landscape management um, uh, strategy for adapting to flood and drought risk. Here you see on the top on the right, a landscape with a range of practices across the watershed um, that, that could be employed to help slow the flow, if you will, across that landscape. So the idea is that without management, if you look on the kind of middle on the, uh, of the bowl, uh, image, um, the, the water systems are subject to m a higher degree of fluctuation. And you can go quickly from a period with low water stress to, to a flood flooding situation because water moves very quickly throughout the landscape. Um, but with um, strategic deployment of management across the, the landscape, um, adaptation can reduce these risks and, and keep the flow through the system uh, more moderate through time. Um, with respect to human health, uh, we assess that uh, climate change has had wide-ranging effects on lives and livelihoods. 
um, and has affected healthcare systems and community cohesion. Um, and and uh, these are diverse impacts that will require um, integrative and integrate, into innovative responses and a lot of collaboration between many sectors of society um, to address them. Um, also, because of historical and systemic biases, uh, communities of color are especially vulnerable to the negative impacts of climate change and mitigation and adaptation, um, for example, using uh, expanded green infrastructure or early uh, heat health warning systems uh, have potential to improve individual and community health and can be uh, particularly uh, um, impactful when developed in collaboration with affected communities. Um, something else to call out um, with respect to human health is even if we don't have a lot of uh, wildfire in the Midwest, the air moves across boundaries and there are increasingly frequent incidents of poor, poor air quality associated with fire. Um, this was actually a, a, a satellite image taken before this past summer um, showing smoke coming down from Canada and, and affecting um, um, uh, states in the Midwest. Uh, with respect to the built environment, um, increases in temperature and extreme precipitation are already um, challenging the aging infrastructure in the Midwest and are expected to, to impair surface transportation, uh, water navigation, as well as the electrical grid. Um, changes in the timing and intensity of rainfall are expected to disrupt transportation along our major river networks. Um, and increased chronic flooding. Uh, and finally, um, green infrastructure, um, along with public and private investments, may help to mitigate losses and provide relief from heat, as well as other ways to, to better adapt the built environment to a changing climate. And an example of that is shown here on the right um, with innovative port design uh, for coastal infrastructure along the Great Lakes. This is specifically at Ash, Ashtabula Port, uh, showing how there was a wetland creation um, in conjunction with keeping the, um, the channel for the river open through dredging. Uh, our last key message was on water. Uh, and um, the, the main points here were that climate changes are uh, affecting both water quantity and quality and increasing risks to ecosystem health, food production, um, surface and groundwater uses, as well as recreation. Um, the projected increases in droughts and floods, as well as runoff across the Mississippi River and uh, Basin, as well as the Great Lakes, will adversely affect ecosystems through increased uh, erosion, as well as incidents of harmful algal blooms and uh, the expansion of invasive species. Uh, and finally, um, federal and state agencies, as well as other NGOs, are working together to, to try to adapt efforts um, to re related to uh, managing for stream flow, water quality, and other issues. Um, and in, uh, on the right, um, an example of um, uh, water-related issues intersecting with the built environment, um, illustrating how dam failure has important uh, downstream, literally, influences on things like the electrical gr grid, um, communications, um, physical structures, and transportation, um, and sort of highlighting um, adaptation pathways to help deal with this intersection of aging infrastructure and, and changes in the hydrologic cycle. And so uh, with that, that brings me to the end of Kind of the the very high level overview. I hope I haven't disappointed too many people by by keeping it at that broad high level. But I wanted to touch on the breadth of our Midwestern report. Um, you can always go and read the chapter uh, yourself, and I'm happy to to speak uh, to people individually, um, you know, in more detail about the findings. Um, but I thought I'd end off with a few comments on how to get involved um, in future NCAs. Um, but before I do that, I would draw your attention to the fact that there is uh, 
Right now, the initial planning stages for the first national nature assessment, uh, from what I've seen, this is gonna be very similar to national climate assessments. And so here you see the calls in the federal register for request for public nominations of authors and technical inputs for the assessment, as well as framing the, the national nature assessment. And so essentially very similar um, calls to these would be uh, probably coming as the, the next NCA is being spun up. But if you're more interested in participating in the nature assessment, you may want to check out these opportunities. Um, as far as getting involved in the next NCA, I would just say, remember, these are more than climatological analyses, and so broad expertise is required. Um, so, so don't be shy if, if uh, you're not a climatologist or atmospheric scientist. Uh, you can certainly nominate yourself to be an author once the calls are out, um, as well as contribute to public review. Um, so to keep, keep your eyes peeled um, at the USGCRP website, uh, as well as um, calls in the Federal Register. And again, please, if you're interested, please reach out. I'm happy to chat with you more about my experience and, and you know, how much time is involved if, if, you're, um, if you are interested. And with that, um, I'm just showing you here the uh, ways to, to connect with USGCRP and find the report. And uh, I'll leave up uh, this uh, slide for questions showing a couple of the um, art, uh, artwork submissions uh, that were included um, in NCA5. Okay. I should have mentioned at the beginning of the webinar that uh, we'd ask that you type any questions into the chat box. So there is a chat box that you can access at the toolbar. Go ahead and type any questions in there and we'll get through them. Um, and I'll, I'll kick it off with a quick question here, Jeff. Uh, you know, it's probably not very often that we get the chance to um, do a, a big synthesis and then try to come to some consensus over over things like climate change impacts. And can you talk a little bit more about like that process of coming to consensus and how that went, whether there were challenges or if it was just a smooth sailing every time? Uh, right, yeah, okay, thanks, Mike. Um, yeah, I can certainly speak to that a little bit. Um, of course, this is gonna be specific to, to my experience with you know our chapter team. Um, overall, in general, I would say we had a really great uh, team as far as people working well together um, and 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 getting along, which is, I think, important to, for that to be easy to do. Also, um, I, I, I again would say that our chapter lead author, Aaron Wilson, uh, was an exceptional leader and and I think a lot of the reason perhaps that we had such an easy time was because of his leadership on making sure that everyone's opinions was heard, were, were heard. Um, uh, but, you know, um, the, the way I guess it, it worked it, it, more mechanically was, you know, at the beginning at that drafting up of the annotated outline, um, we, we naturally kind of filtered in to subgroups and so a lot of the time we would be working closely with a subgroup say for natural resources which is what what i was involved with and um yeah it, it was a lot of just discussion um people providing their thoughts and inputs and kind of working it around to to really distill what what we thought were the most important um uh, topics and uh, I think having the the sort of um, expectation set for people being open minded and and listening to ev what everyone had to say um, made it a, a a process that worked very well and it was not difficult in our my experience with this chapter but I I don't know if everybody would say the same thing in all the other chapters. <laughs> okay. 
I, of the I'm sorry, I don't have any any uh, stories of people yelling and oh, screaming right. and banging what on tables. <laughs> did part of that consensus include the likeliness uh, scenarios? Like um, yeah, that I mean, so um, you know, the key messages were really uh, and the writing. Every uh, those subgroups contributed the text, and it was all then synthesized. And we, it, there was the requirement that we had meetings where the whole team had to be there and, and we went through every key message and everybody had to agree on, on that calibrated language. Um, we also, in, in coming to our consensus at the chapter level, we, we did look around at what other chapters were producing to make sure that, uh, you know, we that there was we, we didn't seem that we were too different I, I guess in terms of being way more certain about everything or way less certain than ever just to, just to get a sense of kind of where other people were um but yeah you know yeah okay hopefully that's helpful yeah again uh feel free to type any questions into the chat box um nothing is coming in currently there's q and a let's see you see a q and a uh yes yes we oh, have okay. one we okay. have a couple questions okay, yeah. in the q and a all right let me read one off here from rob jacobson are there economics of mitigation addressed in any of the chapters uh yes uh there is an economics chapter i believe this is the first time there was a an economics chapter explicitly in NCA five in an NCA. Let me go back. Um, uh, yeah, chapter nineteen. Uh, there's an economics chapter, and also uh, the social systems and justice chapter is is also new uh, for NCA five. All right, so we'll look into those sections for that kind of information. Uh, next question is from uh, Craig Parker. What advice do you have to someone that may submit a nomination for similar assessments? That is, what skills do you think were most needed other than your technical expertise of the time? Mm. Oh, that's a good question. Um, I think um, I think it, it is important to uh, be open-minded and, and have also kind of be thinking about things at different scales, um, being able to, you know, work in a very diverse team. Um, I think patience is probably a virtue in, in something like this, especially if you recall back to the slide I mentioned about following all of the policies. Um, I know I'm, I'm pretty sure I was, uh, the, the academics were getting frustrated about, uh, you know what we the uh, uh, the the logistics of of the uh, technology that we were forced to use because of complying with with statutes um, and mandates. Um, so so I mean and, and also I think um, being being just uh, or organized and uh, being able to stay on top of uh of the schedule um and, and being uh, not uh, i guess um this was a something i learned very quickly was um the uh the schedule is very they were very unbending with their schedule and so um i i, I think uh being able to, to to deal with with that is was also pretty important all right uh, next question from William Folk. What are the prospects this will influence producers and legislators? Uh, we did not assess that. <laughs> um, but, but I could comment, though, that uh, I believe um, we, uh, this is my first time in, uh, being involved with an NCA. Uh, they are doing a lot. They have a lot more expectation that authors will be out there uh, helping to roll out the report and engaging and get get the news out as it were um, this time around. And I think with the 
um, increased public engagement in certain areas, there's a bigger emphasis on really getting the word out um, across broad audiences. Um, and so I would hope that that could help with um, making the uh, report more influential. Okay. And then Zach Leeser asks, as your team prepares to pass a baton for the next assessment, are there any national topics, ag, water, built environment, et cetera, that you think will be a focus in the next assessment, Spe specific specifically for the Midwest? Yeah, okay. Um, I mean, I, I think uh, in, in, in many ways, um, there are kind of some ma major overarching issues that will continue to be to, to require attention and certainly water and agriculture are are going to be very important in the midwest um you know but I, I, so i would say those for sure i think natural resources as well um you know, um, it is a bit difficult to say because there there is some influence based on the author team. But I think if you think of the Midwest and if you think about, you know, what is really important for people and the economies, um, I, I, those are some some key areas that are not going to go away anytime soon. And, uh, and so I I would expect subtle variation from report to report. Although, um, for example, uh, we we had a natural resources section that was much broader this time around. Um, whereas in the previous assessment, there was a forestry specific key message. And we broadened it to, to natural resources this time around because of how much detail had been provided in that previous assessment. So you may see kind of subtle changes like that, um, somewhat driven by the composition of the author team. Okay. All right, well, it looks like we've gotten through all the questions. Um, with that, thank you again for providing the webinar today. There will be a recording uh, available Probably in a few weeks, it'll be on the site. Uh, so you can pass that along to anyone that missed this. And um, this is the last webinar for this calendar year. And we'll be having uh, continued webinars uh, coming, coming next semester. So thank you again for attending. Thank you, Jeff. No problem. Thank you. Thank okay. you.